Yeah, I think we'll hit on several of these topics as we go through. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm usually here Tuesdays and Thursdays in September. Um, can't really stand there. In September, I was just in, a, in the field a bunch, um, and I should mostly be in October, November here as we get rolling. Um, so yeah, I'm with the Inventory and Monitoring Program. Maybe I'll just sit and stand. Um, and so that was started, I think, almost 15 years ago now. And the basic idea was that in order to manage our natural resources on the parks, you gotta, you gotta know what's there. You can't manage for Mexican spotted owls if we don't even know they're there. And a lot of people were surprised, that particularly the smaller or medium-sized parks, um, when we came in and did these basic inventories, they might have been the first time that somebody had actually done a fish inventory or an amphibian inventory in these parks. In the larger parks, they did, like Black Canyon and Kirikani are larger in our, our world um, with a natural resource staff. They had a lot of information, but a lot of the smaller ones didn't. And then once you have those um, basic inventories, um, using create ecological indicators to set up long-term monitoring plans. Um, and that all came, this guy, Richard West Sellers, um, gets a lot of credit for pushing the Park Service to do this. Um, he basically, this book took a uh, history of the National Park Service natural resource management, and it wasn't a very glowing um, review. Uh, basically, they said there's, you know, there was a good bunch of good people in the Park Service, but the um, the structure was not there. So when that good person left, basically all the information left with them. And he documented a lot of times where he'd do the same white-tailed deer, deer survey in one park or um, basically rehash the same decisions all over again because they weren't well documented. So that was part of our, our world. Um, and in this, and then, so that followed up with the State of the Parks report that came after the Richard West Sellers book. Um, and so there's about 250, 260 natural resource parks, and that goes pretty far down the list. Um, I used to work in Texas, and I worked at the LBJ um, ranch, and that basically was an exotic pasture, and that made the list of natural resources. So they went pretty far down um, the list. And of those 260 or so parks, only 80 of them didn't have a single natural resource manager. And that might be, that's, those are usually parks that weren't natural first. They were old historic forts or homesteads or things like that where it was a cultural park first, but still there were significant natural resources and we didn't have anybody to help manage them. Um, and then another third um, had one or two people. So almost two thirds of the park didn't really have natural resources. And the other thing that both sellers and this book, uh, I mean, in this report documented was that all of the energy goes to the crisis of the day. It's the new invasive plant. It's, you know, quagga mussels at the park. That's all they have time to deal with. Um, it takes up all their resources, a new fire. Um, a lot of the people are dual, so they might be on rescues or things like that. Um, and there was no time to think about where do we want to get the park service to and what do we want sagebrush to look like at Kirikani or what do we want um, pinyon juniper to look like at Black Canyon. There was no time to even to think about what we want it to and then say where, where it is now. So our program, other people refer to it as the Vital Signs Program. Vital Signs was our cute name to um, say what our ecological indicators are. And that top is the definition, and I'm going to read it because I kind of want to make a point. Um, so vital signs are these subset of physical, chemical, and biological elements and processes of park ecosystems that are selected to represent the overall health or condition of park resources, known or hypothesized effects of stressors. And if you stopped right there, uh, most, I think, ecologists would generally agree that that's a pretty good definition of an ecological indicator. Um, for vital signs, they added this last phrase, elements that have important human values. So that meant that it could add endangered species that are, might be important to monitor, and we are mandated to monitor, but it, they may not be a good indicator. Or water quality might be another one. Um, say at Glen Canyon, it's a reservoir, it's an, or Blue Mesa for that matter. Um, water quality in a reservoir may not be that big a deal for, from the natural perspective, since some might argue that it's a biological desert or it's filled with exotics. Um, but it is pretty important if you're a superintendent and you've got people bathing in it every single day. Um, the other key part, um, so you're going to see in a minute, we cover 16 parks. But the idea was that really we're covering 
we want to say what is the condition of sagebrush at Black Canyon and then what is the condition of sagebrush at Fossil Butte National Monument. It's not what's the condition of sagebrush across the northern Colorado Plateau. It's these each individual parks um, and our whole reason for being is to give information to managers. Uh, that's our primary goal, not to make management decisions but to give them information where they can um, then make more educated decisions. So there's our 32 networks that they divided the country up into, um, 270 or so parks, um, kind of grows every year, um, and just kind of grouped them by geographic proximity and tried to do ecological similarities. The Colorado Plateau really could have been one big, one network, but we, it's already, it's a, it's a really NPS rich environment, the Colorado Plateau. Um, we have 16 parks in the Southern Colorado Plateau as 19, and that's our two of the, largest networks as it was, so they divided up into two. Um, there's our network, so we're, we're pushing the very, very edge of the Colorado Plateau. Um, maybe you might even not call it Gunnison <laughs> Colorado Plateau, but certainly as you get out into Kirikani and down to Black Canyon, you're back on the plateau. So the very eastern edge, um, four parks in Colorado, one small one in Wyoming and one small one in Arizona, and then basically everything in Utah except for Glen Canyon. Um, so these on the side are, are Field-based protocols, what we decided to do, and this all, this all came from the parks, um, what we decided to monitor. And it took several years, we built conceptual models, we had workshops with ex experts come in to help us pick what these indicators should be, um, what are the relevant management questions, and not every park could get every one of these. So as you'll see, the, the blue stars just popped up and those, all, those parks all wanted invasive exotic plants. Uplands, uh, which includes both, that I'm going to talk about more, but includes both soils and crusts and vegetation, um, is one of our biggest um, protocols. Um, we originally had riparian streams or riparian systems, um, but we kind of divided it up into weightable and big rivers because, say, our, our stream at Arches is courthouse wash. I don't know if you've ever been down there, but it's just basically a wash. Natural bridges is the same way versus um, for big rivers, we're on the Gunnison and Colorado and the Green and the Yampa, so on much bigger systems and different questions to be answered. Um, springs and seeps are focused on the Moab area parks. Um, we do water quality almost everywhere um, that there are water bodies to monitor. And then we do land birds in most places as well. Um, and then we have another four protocols that we say are our office-based protocols. And the land condition and land cover, those are remote sensing using um, MODIS and Landsat imagery. And that's just basically two different pixels. MODIS is 30 meter pixels and Landsat's 250 meters. Um, and then climate and air quality. We, those we basically just use, use existing monitoring programs and repackage them so they're more useful to us and more useful to the parks. Um, so we don't actually, we're not climate climatologists or air quality people, but uh, harvest the stuff that's out there and make it much more usable. So the idea here is that we're, we've got things integrated across these different scales. So at the very basic unit, the classic field biology down at the bottom, um, you're out, in, yeah, out on the ground with your you know, one meter plot or point count or whatever it might be and collecting information. And then with the Landsat and the MODIS based imagery, we've got a coarser picture above it. Um, and we can link, and I'm going to show you how we're linking some of the upland stuff with um, the MODIS satellite imagery. And basically, yeah. it, we can, ideally, we can expand our knowledge base. So we can't cover um, everything on the ground. Um, for, for example, weightable streams, each park got to pick one stream. Um, they didn't, we, so we're not doing it across the parks and that was a big that was actually a big early debate um, a lot of the parks said hey you know we need to make decisions whether you're there or not so we'd rather spread you across um, all of our streams and we 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 argued that we were we were put in to do good science and it's much easier in my mind to do good science on one stream and then if there's an opportunity for money say hey this is we can, we can tell you what's going on here if you give us more we can tell you what's going on in three more streams rather than we think maybe we know what's going on, and if you give us more money, maybe we might be able to tell you a little bit more about something that we're not sure about to start with. Um, so, yeah, and then, then obviously, precip, temperature, and air quality are major drivers, but much coarser than even the satellite imagery. If we can link all those together, um, we're really doing our job. Um, and I should add, you guys feel free to poke up a hand or, or um, ask a question. Yep. What kind of voice do you use when you're making suggestions like that? 
in that case, you know, like, are you kind of demanding that, you know, this is, you know, we feel like we could be doing a much better job like that, or do you have much say in that? Um, yeah, I mean, ultimately, we got, to, we were the, the science capacity, so we won that argument, if you will. I mean, it wasn't terribly hard, but there were some people that just said, you know, even a little bit of information would be good, and to me, if you're trying to build a science program, a little bit of information that isn't scientifically valid isn't really worth having, and so you might as well just do what you were doing before. Uh, and it, it really ranges in the management at a Black Canyon or a Kirkani or Zion, some of those larger parks where they have big staff, we really are just giving them information. At say Golden Spike, where the two trains came together in Utah, um, they might rely on us a lot more for some of these management decisions. So yeah, upland monitoring, um, looking at vegetation composition and structure, but also a lot of a lot of the soils, uh, biological soil crust and exotic plants, ground cover soil stability. Um, if you haven't been, if you're new to the area, you should really get down to the Moab area and see this living soil, it's pretty pretty dang cool. Although I admit, I still kind of want to step on it. You're not supposed to, but it just looks, it's like bubbles that come in your packaging, you know, that you want to just pop. Um, so these are the parks that we do monitoring in. And as you can see all the way over there on your right, um, we had to pick target areas. We couldn't do upland monitoring everywhere. Um, and again, that was kind of the same thing I was just talking about at streams. We're gonna focus on the Capitol Reef example and their grasslands there. Um, so with all of our all of our monitoring, the idea is that again we're giving information to management, and this cup and ball has been used by a lot of people um, to kind of explain. But quickly to to go over the resource of interest would be the ball itself, and the ability to move that ball is the ecosystem's resistance. Um, up here in the mountains where there's a lot of native species, we probably have much higher resistance than we do in the desert where we've got a large, a lot of large exotic ungulates called cows. Um, the soil is pretty fragile. Um, it takes a long time for soil to recover there where here you, you naturally have a more dynamic system. Yeah. Is that soil still called cryptobiotic soil? Or yep. Is it yeah, there's lots of names for it. I, okay. I was wondering if they changed the name because when I was just in Utah, we got like that little tablet, and mm -hmm. you say cryptobiotic anymore. It says something else, but I can't remember. Yeah, I, I, is fine with me. I don't, I'm not an authority. Crusts. Biological crust. Yeah, Cyanobacteria is another one. I think they call it biological crust. I think it sounds better than crypto. I know. Maybe Changes colors. It's cool <laughs> when it gets wet. Um, so yeah. Um, but then each of these ecosystems have a threshold where if you actually push that ball over that threshold and get to the next valley, some would argue you might not be able to ever bring it back to its optimal system. Um, and if you do, it's going to cost you a lot of money and a lot of human power. Um, and then so the ability for the to come back, I mean, all systems are going to move um, one way or the other. Think fire, think fire systems, they're going to naturally build up and then they're going to burn and come back. Uh, they're all going to have some resilience. Um, our desert systems are not as resistant or resilient. So there's a, this is an example again. We've got the cup and ball there on the bottom. Um, the black box would represent the historic condition. We really don't have much of that anymore. Um, and we, we almost don't even know what it is. Um, the, the settlers and the livestock got here before the scientists did for the most part. Um, and so we, there's not a, and there's not a lot of places that haven't been grazed. Um, there was, I, there's a guy at Glen Canyon who's done a lot of this trying to find remnants and he actually tried to go up on some of the mesas that are all rock, you know, rocks all around them. And he was doing, going up there doing work one time and, had, and saw a Navajo carrying a sheep on his back that the Navajo would then leave up there all summer and then in the fall come and slaughter it and bring it back down. So that was a natural fence. And um, so even these, these little islands that you think maybe haven't been touched have been. So most of our systems, a lot of our systems in the park, thankfully, are still in pretty good shape. And they would look like this green on the left. Um, still a lot of annuals present. Um, a few exotics, but not many, um, and that cryptobiotic crust, biological soil, um, down at the bottom. Um, again, it, 
sorry if, if this is redundant, but if you're new to the area, it's, it's with so little moisture and so little rain, if you can imagine that crust on the left, there's lots of little spots for a water dropule to stay there, lots of little spots for a seed to get caught in one of those valleys that then has more moisture in it. Um, the, these little microclimates are everything in terms of seed germination. Um, and then you get these more invaded grasslands where you start to lose your perennial grasses. You get more annual grasses, uh, more exotics, um, until you get all the way over to that annualized state um, that would be much, much harder to restore. Um, the biological soy crust is basically gone, and it's dominated by exotic annuals. So ideally, we're trying to help managers take action before they get to that point. Um, Capitol Reef, um, again, if you're not from out here, you're, you might be surprised that even in national parks, we, have, we continue to have grazing. Again, they were all here before the parks were, and in a lot of cases, there was no way to get a park in place other than to um, say the allotments will continue. Um, some parks are grazed in perpetuity. Most of them have some kind of easement where the owner of the allotment can pass it on for a generation, or sometimes it dies with the allotment. Um, at Capitol Reef, um, the ungrazed area was actually an allotment that expired in the 80s. Um, so these are two basically equal ecocytes. Um, one is still grazed and one is ungrazed. And again, the Park Service can't end the allotment, but they can, they do have the ability to say if something's impaired or resources of concern, that they could go to the BLM um, to change the allotment. So that's the other tricky part, that these allotments are bigger than the park. Um, there's fences in the, inside the park that go outside the park um, where the cows go in and out, and the cows don't know, the, they know the allotment, they don't know the park boundary at all. <coughs> so again, yeah, pretty, pretty as equal as we could possibly make them, these two ecocytes, these two grazed and ungrazed areas. Um, some just real basic results. One of the, uh, a good indicator is your canopy gap or basal gap, depending on where you do it, and that's just basically on a transect, how far between vegetation and the next clump of vegetation. Um, again, it's not like we have here in the mountains where that would be very, very small. Um, we got pretty big gaps out there. So the bottom one, which, what I want you to focus on is that largest um, gap on the lower right there, more than 200 centimeters in size gap, and 60% of the gaps were larger than 200 centimeters, where in the ungrazed area, that's 25%. So a fairly decent different there, difference there. Um, Again, grazed and ungrazed, you're looking at perennial grasses. Um, those are the things that take time, less, more disturbance, fewer perennial grasses, less disturbance, more perennial grasses. So ungrazed higher than the grazed. The cyanobacteria is the stuff that's only present on the really well-developed soil crusts. Um, so you, again, you have to have less disturbance and say in bare soil is the opposite. The, as you saw in that kind of cup and ball, the more disturbance, the more bare soil and same goes with the basal gaps, canopy gaps. Species richness, um, if you're new to the plant world, this is pretty common to kind of have your plots on the bottom and your species richness on the y-axis. And then, so ideally you should reach an asymptote and that the asymptote, and that means you've basically found most of the species in, those, in that area. Um, so grazed versus ungrazed. More species rich and generally more species rich makes you more resilient and more resistant. That um, all these apply to Capital Reef? Yeah, this is all from Capital Reef data. How did you choose um, how many plots to put at each park? Because I saw one park was really small, but still had a lot of plots, and then some parks were really big and had a lot of plots. It was all done through power analyses, and um, the desert ones are more complicated because we actually do a rotational panel because if we went to the same plots every year, we would probably be monitoring the effects of us. <laughs> um, and the biological soil crust. So we basically do two and then rest them for seven years. And that, that could be part of it too. If you're in a more resistant ecosystem up higher, say at um, Cedar Breaks, I can't remember which one. Could you explain power analysis? Sure. Um, so basically we, and this is, we'll get into this again with water quality, but for uplands, again, we, we, we almost don't know what, managers don't really know what they want or what the optimal condition is because we don't really have it. Um, but the idea behind a power analysis is we want to detect a 5% change in sagebrush over the next 30 years. Um, <coughs> therefore, we would need X number of plots to detect that. Um, and if we had too few plots, we might need to change a 30% change before we'd actually be confident that we'd be um, detecting that change. And then the other piece of it is what your um, 
what your alpha level is, how, how much of a change. It's you, common to either be 90 or 0 0.5 or 0 0.1 for your detection limit, um, which means there's a five, if it's five, that's a 5% chance that if you find something, it could be wrong. Um, it might not be what you're actually finding it. How to do, you want more? <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> we we're going to cover all the idea of power analysis and sample okay. size analysis in um, six, 612, the quantitative skills. Because it's basically like giving you confidence in your results because you knew you had enough samples, you have good power. And the flip side of it, everything is different. So if you sample it enough, you're going to get a significant difference when maybe biologically it's not a significant difference. So it's, it's a, I don't know. We say we're scientists, but there's a bit of an art there, too, <laughs> in, de in determining what you think is biologically, ecologically significant. So the last piece of this is the species that are present, even with all those other differences, um, the species that are present in the ungrazed area are the, the lima beans and Brussels sprouts, um, the ones that the cows don't like, where the ones that are present in the ungrazed area are your cotton candy species, the stuff they'd eat first. So now we're going to show how we're linking this up with our remote sensing um, and MODIS. And basically the two things we look at with MODIS, it's pretty coarse stuff, is the snow cover extent and then basically how green things is. NDVI is the normalized difference vegetation index, but basically it's how green is the earth. Um, MODIS comes, we get it every eight days. So there's satellites that are going around the earth. So that's, that's a key part in terms of phenology, which is when green, things green up. Um, and with all those d different measures, you can say how productive an ecosystem is. The other thing that you can do is th with the exotic annuals, things like cheatgrass, those green up much, much earlier than the native species. So if you see a big pulse in early spring, you know that's probably cheatgrass and you don't actually need to be on the ground to go look for it. So here's our NDVI stuff raw. Um, you're looking at, so this is where we are right here, Black Canyon, Kirkani, the Moab areas down here, dinosaur and Capitol Reef in the middle. Um, color enhanced and then you green it up and it, it again, same deal. Um, here's the park and you can see where the mountains are, where the desert is. Um, this is the LaSalle's if you've been down to Moab that's our 12,000 foot pe peaks right there. The Henry Mountains are here. Um, so it all, it all shows up pretty well. Um, and then this is what I was talking about. It, again, there's a lot here, but basically it's time of day and uh, time of year on the bottom and then how green it is on the y-axis. And with an NDVI, you can do things like the start of growing season, the end of growing season, the whole area under here would be the net product productivity for the area, um, length of season, um, peak productivity, a bunch of things you can get out of that. And you can basically tweak that to your heart's desire once you have those curves. Um, and with longer term stuff like climate change, the peak, the start of growing season and growing degree days are all, all pretty key in, in understanding that at a coarse level. So again, our grazed and ungrazed, um, they look a little bit different here. The, the black boxes that are behind are actually the pixel size. So you can see some, in some cases the pixels don't exactly match up, but we did, did the best we could. Um, so this is basically, MODIS started in 2000, so it's the first 11 years. And again, it's basically on the Y is how green it was. And so this top one is the ungrazed area and the lower one is the grazed area. So basically almost, almost across the board, always a little bit more um, productive on that ungrazed area. And then this is basically taking this graph and lumping this all together. So these are your average day of the year of these 11, 10, 12 years here. Um, and again, almost always the grazed is um, higher. And so the, the error bars there are your confidence intervals. And so I guess the easy, quick ways, if the confidence intervals don't overlap, these are significantly different when they do. Um, then it gets a little bit into where you adjust your, your alpha level and whatnot. Um, but most, I, don't, I, I can't think of a statistician that would say if your confidence intervals don't overlap, um, that it's not biologically significant. Um, 
So again, kind of going back to that early slide that we had um, in terms of linking things, we're trying to present multiple lines of evidence. We know that one case might not be enough, just the upland data on the ground um, could easily say, well, you didn't look everywhere, you only looked in these certain areas and maybe you picked the areas to support your argument. Um, but the flip side, if you just looked at remote sensing, well, you're not even looking on the ground, how do you know what these species are? Um, just because one area is more productive than another doesn't necessarily mean it's better if the species aren't right. But, the, but combining all that, I think we have a pretty solid argument on there are effects of um, cattle on those two allotments. Now, it's not my job um, as I'm lecturing here as a Park Service employee to say whether those are bad or good. If you want to talk about it in the hallway outside, um, when I'm not lecturing, then we can say something different. Um, but our job, again, is to give that to the managers and it's them, then their choice to decide how to deal with that. Um, and quite frankly, I'm not, I wouldn't be a good person to help decide that because I'm not living in Torrey, Utah like these people are and dealing with their stakeholders and their surrounding land uses. Um, and Utah politics are very, very different than Colorado politics. We've got one park dinosaur that straddles the line and goes into both. Um, and it is entirely, right now they're actually going through an environmental impact statement that they have to do every 10 years for the grazing. So it's a chance for them to kind of put some of this out there, but they also feel like they've, the chief of resources basically said, we need to be careful because um, Capitol Reef ha is a natural park, but there's also a big historic component to it. And a Utah Senator could put something in a rider somewhere on, I don't know, um, airport security and say that this rider says that Capitol Reef, that grazing is an important component and it shall be there forevermore. Um, if you don't believe me, this is the Capitol Reef Field Station that is actually a beautiful facility. It's super green, but it was the result of a rider from Orrin Hatch, and it was a little in-holding piece in the middle of the park. Utah Valley University wanted a field station. Um, Orrin Hatch is, likes Utah Valley uh, University and put it there. The Park Service did not want it there. Um, it's right in the center of the park. It's in the middle of wilderness. It overlooks Pleasant Creek that a lot of people like to backpack on. Um, some people might say it's a giant middle finger in the middle of a wilderness area. But it, now that it's there, we've, we've actually used it and it's pretty, but that whole thing, the Park Service basically had no control over it because um, it wasn't, wasn't Park Service property. I didn't get the same field station when I worked there. Oh, you should. <laughs> <laughs> um, so and I, 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 if some of you, I think there are a couple people that maybe did undergrad here and might have taken Jeff um, Jeff's policy class, um, but I, I put this sec perfect. But I put this section in. Um, maybe I'm preaching to the choir. Maybe I'm not because we don't. We're not all quintessential environmentalists here. Um, but I'd like to put this section in. It's my attempt at the butterflies, wings, and the Amazon affect caribou herds kind of deal. Um, like, why should you care about biological soil crust and Capitol Reef? You don't like deserts. You like you're here at Western because you like being in the mountains and whatnot. Uh, Biological soil crust and soil stability. So these are actual classes that we use um, when we're out in the field. Again, this really well-developed stuff down here. You're thinking if you're a drop of moisture or a seed, where would you land and stay versus up there where you just get swept, uh, swept away at the next wind or rainstorm. Um, water erosion is huge in the desert. You know, an inch of rain can result in these huge, huge flash floods, which are really cool to watch and are part of the system. But if you don't have that biological soil crust, you've got a much different system than you um, would with it. Um, Jane Belknap is kind of the queen of biological soil crust, the USGS ecologist at Moab, and most of this work is from either from her or her students. Um, and she's basically set up these rainfall simulators in the desert, and she has acknowledged that some of her work basically, I mean, she's got all these little plots where, with little paths all around them um, that have crushed the crust that was there. So here we've got basically um, your low developed. So these purple bars across all of these are basically the equivalent of these ones and twos. Um, and then these yellow bars would be the fives and sixes, the ones that are really well developed, have the different colors, the different topography. Um, and basically two things more or less showing the same thing, total runoff from these plots versus um, total sediment loss. And this was all from these artificial rainfall events. Basically in dry systems, um, even in dry with no rain, your high crest 
your well-developed soil crusts have less runoff, particularly in the shallow soils and the deep soils, maybe it doesn't matter quite as much. Um, but if you get into these 30 minute wet periods that we have um, that are kind of the, the more frequent rain event in the desert is the 30 minute rain, 30 minute um, wet event. And then these more monsoonals where we get a monsoon that comes in and sticks that doesn't happen as much, but usually happens a couple times a year and are pretty significant events. And when you get to this level, these 24 hour wet periods, there really is a really big difference between even the, in some cases, the moderate level of crust and the high developed crust. And a huge difference between the basically the low versus the high. Wind is the same, same deal. Um, if you're around this spring and on campus, you may get to see one of these events. Um, same type of slide here. Um, nutrient runoff with well-developed soil crust versus um, less soil developed crust. Basically, when there's less soil development, you've got a ton of, a ton of runoff. Um, so again, why does that matter? I don't want to go to the desert. I don't like being hot. Um, I want to be up here. This is Aspen in 2009. Um, Aspen doesn't have a lot of soil that's that, that, that color in the air um, during a big spring runoff event. Um, same deal in Aspen um, and you can see the actual three or four different events and the, and the problem with this is as this melts then this stays on top and as it melts more then this combines with this and you really get a really different colored snow and um, you know, if you wear a dark jacket versus a light jacket, you're going to be a lot warmer in the wintertime here. Um, and same thing goes for the snow. Um, again, here we are, um, Blue Mesa, the West Elks, the desert, um, the LaSalle's again. This is, I believe these are eight days apart um, in that same 2009, the texture of the snow from space. So that's a much, much different solar impact um, with that. And this is me last year in March at Crested Butte Mountain Resort. Um, it was kind of ugly, and not very fun to ski on. Um, and lastly, maybe again, I'm preaching to the choir, but this is IPCC, the kind of quintessential climate change report. Um, basically, Stuff all over the world, um, if you just look at the blue, this is the possibility of what our climate could be with natural forcings only. And then the red is including anthropogenic forcings and then the black line is actual observed. Um, and I put this in there again, this policy class that I, that I do this talk in with Jeff has a wide range. And my point is basically, we can argue about what to do about the climate, but we can't really argue with the science. People try to, but the science is so, so clear. Um, there's, there's, lots, there's lots of ways we can argue policy about what to do. Um, this might be a student call. All right. Let me check. Sure. Hello? Yes. Hey, Dominic, I'm going to put my speakerphone. Are you on GoToMeeting? OK, let me um, make sure my computer's open that. Hold on a second. All right, this is Dominique joining in. Oh, the LaSalle's. <laughs> Sorry, it's one of my favorite places. <laughs> All right. Are you so? Can you see me on um, GoToMeeting or my screen? No. Hmm. Okay. Um, I have it, so you should be able to see the uh, the video. Oh, no, no worries. Yeah. So, yeah. You can argue about what to do about it, but with the science, we shouldn't be arguing about anymore. Um, and then this is put in there again, thinking about the runoff. This is the average days that predicted to change in runoff, your peak runoff. And we've got a big, basically, red dot on 
us in this area of the country. Um, and again, I put this in, all right, so hopefully I've caught somebody because they like the desert or they've come to Western because they like living in the mountains. Chances are they like to ski. But if you don't, you probably have know somebody in LA, Phoenix, Tucson, one of those cities. And if our runoff comes early, that's not what our, even our if you're pro dam or anti dam, our reservoirs are not, would not be set up to capture a huge, huge peak runoff at an earlier time. And we wouldn't have the water that we basically need. Are there any, uh, is there any baseline information on like historic um, dust events? Like how long have you keeping track of that? Um, I, I, I guess I don't know the answer to that. I know people have looked at it. I think it's, it, it, they always have happened, um, yeah. but I think the general consensus is the frequency and intensity of them is, is different. Um, the long-term stuff um, with the soil stability is well documented. It's much less stable than it used to be in these grazed H ATV, OHV uses. I, do you, have, do you know that at all? Yeah, mm -hmm. I've looked into the dust on snow for, for quite a while now, and we just know that it's getting worse and yeah. worse every year. And, and um, Tom is actually involved with the, with the. Oh, not really. Um, so I used to work with Mountain Studies Institute, and we worked a little bit with the Center for Snow and Avalanche Center. They've been car Center for Snow and Avalanche Studies. Yeah, then they have this. Then they have a whole other dust on snow program that's a separately funded entity too, and they've been they've been studying it down here in the San. Yeah, that's not a silver turn or something. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I didn't say it. Nasty. They're actually using wind rose wind rose charts to like calculate, trying to like they're trying to establish direction and and uh, or uh, or origins of of the, of the dust. Yeah. And it's all across the four corners there in front of Utah. Yeah, that's a big issue for grazing on like the Navajo lands and maybe the Ute Mountain Utes or Southern Ute lands. So there's some study going on there trying to look at um, production. Mm -hmm. From the grazing side on the Navajo lands, but also it's like, wow, this is a lot of bare ground, and is it because of overgrazing? Right. Um, has that any, anyone seen the storms? I know that you showed the picture, but uh, did you realize that's like a red cloud? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's gross. It's when it comes in, like I it was in Telluride, and Telluride the box came in, and I saw it move in. I mean, you're like, well, there's a big snowstorm there, and they're like, is it a thunderstorm? They're like, no, it's just dust mm -hmm. and snow mixed together, and it's, it's really bizarre. And it, Imagine it changes everything as far as the snow melt and seasonality. Yeah, it, it also like well, because the, the snow melts melts sooner, <coughs> so we, we actually are losing more water through transpiration because yeah. we're exposing more more plants and they start being productive earlier, and so we're actually theoretically decreasing the overall amount available in the runoff. Um, not you know not only is it running off quicker and sooner and more in one big, but there's going to be less of it over the predicted be less of it over. Yeah, and I don't know if you guys have heard of the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab up in Gothic. I mean, world-class facility right up the road, and they have some really good stuff on, you know, if we lose this soil moisture, that's, that's the, the big reservoir it isn't Blue Mesa, it's the mountains, and right. it's keeping soil moisture for all these wildflowers that we have in the summertime. And all I know is that when we get a big spring storm coming through the south, watch out. <laughs> yeah, I was actually going to ask, like, what... Are there any like you know significant weather patterns that come through to promote the yeah. windstorms? Is that like what? Basically, when we have weather? a major low pressure that tracks across the four corners, mm -hmm. that's that's when it comes. And so like we'll, in the southern part of the state, the San Juans, mm -hmm. in, in this area, we we get we do really well from storms that on us on a south southern track as far as moisture availability. Okay. We we get kind of hit with them first as opposed to like northern Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, when, the, when, the, when we get a big low pressure that tracks south, um, we usually means good snow, but it also potential for dust. Okay. And some of this dust, they've even done some tracking of the particles and like, there's like Asian particles in some of these. Yeah, there's even been yeah. Mongolian. Mongolian, that's, yeah. Right. yeah. I remember maybe Which also has its own six. grazing problems. I think 2006 it was Chinese dust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then last year there was three big dust storms that I know of, just in the San Juans, and the, it it just like like both you said it doesn't go anywhere. The snow melts, it stays on top, and it just changes the albedo, and it really changes the snow dramatically. And then the runoff and the seasonality of the runoff comes much quicker, so you get a flashier flood 
earlier in the year versus kind of more sustained. Building soil though up there. <laughs> I don't know, it probably goes down <laughs> first. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. We send it back to Cure Conte. Right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going to switch gear and do one more science -y example and then talk a little bit about how, how we get this information out. Um, water quality is actually a little bit easier for us in a lot of ways in terms of linking to management um, because we have clear thresholds um, and those are our state standards that set by the state. And admittedly a lot of these are for human health and not necessarily biological systems but still that's a pretty important, um, if you're a National Park Service superintendent, human health is pretty important um, for your visitors. Um, we're going to talk about the E. coli example which is this down here which is basically E. coli is poop. Um, to put it bluntly. Um, and we're going to talk about the Zion Narrows. Um, if you've been to Zion, it's a really cool place. The, the Narrows ends at the end of um, the main canyon where most people go, um, the end of the shuttle bus if you're there during peak seasons. Um, it's a spectacular place, but in the summertime it does, it looks like this. There's all kinds of people. Um, the Narrows is a really cool hike that it's on my bucket list. I actually haven't done it. Um, most people do it as an overnight permit, um, but some people actually do it straight through in a day, in a long day, um, all these little uh, slot canyons. Um, and li literally thousands of the people at the end of this um, main canyon. So this, this is again the main canyon. If you've been there, this is the Riverside Walk and that's the end of the Narrows that starts here um, to get there. So for water quality, basically what we try and do in a lot of places um, is monitor the water as it comes in. So the water is coming from the north and going to the south here. This is the Virgin River. Um, and we try and get a spot just as it comes into the park and as it goes out of the park to basically figure out what's going in the park. Um, a lot of the sites that we use outside, these yellow ones, are actually the state of Utah sites. And they're basically the ones that are right next to the road. Um, our sites are usually the ones that are in the interior. And oftentimes some of our sites could take a day's hike in for two hours of work, they camp overnight and hike out. And the state helps us with that because they're super interested in those sites, but they don't have the time to get in there. So we actually get a ton of lab analysis for free from the state because they're really interested in those sites. Um, and then we have two up here because again, um, the issue here is gonna be grazing. There's a grazed allotment and a um, exotic pasture right there along the Virgin River. Um, so we're again pretty, pretty bare bones. We do basically do once a month water quality sampling um, and that's what's over here on the left. Um, with all water quality standards, there's both a chronic and an acute standard. The chronic is lower and basically you shouldn't be routinely violating the chronic standard. But they recognize, particularly in desert systems, um, you can have these big rain events where lots of stuff gets washed in and there could be times when there's high peaks which could even be natural um, or they're, they're not persistent. So you can violate the chronic occasionally. Um, the acute standard is one you basically never want to exceed. Um, and so our monthly monitoring over here on the left started documenting some chronic exceedance and even some acute um, standards. So what that basically did is it triggered the Park Service. We helped them to set up, I mean the Park Service, the Zion, Zion National Park to do more increased monitoring with our methods. Since they're there on, on site, they could actually go and, and sample weekly or a couple times a week. And that basically showed that the chronic, there was a, both a chronic and an acute violation. Um, the, the system was... Um, well, we're just seeing more data points because you, the, the monitoring increased. Increased, yep. Yeah. So yeah, this is just once a, once a month basically down here versus we identified that it was in the summertime. Um, that's when the cows get out there. Um, so let's monitor more in the summertime. Um, let's see. So yeah, we'll get into both of these. Um, so this is actually the pasture right there that's right up next to the Virgin River. So they divert water from the pasture, from the river. It, irrigates the pasture and then there's irrigation return flows. So there's water going in and out of the park. Um, this is 2010 as we increase the frequency. Um, so all the way over here, you basically have these low E. coli levels. The irrigation is working. It's getting ready for the cows to go out there, um, but they're not out there yet. Um, we have the cows enter the pasture and instantly we're above the acute and the chronic 
standards. Um, we were actually somewhat fortuitous that one of these monsoon events actually washed out those ditches. Um, there was so much rain and, and clogged them up. So in August of August 19th, and so then the cows were still out there, but there was no return flow. Um, so even with the cows out there, there was still, I mean, there, was, there weren't the exceedances. Um, so to me, that's a pretty strong thing that it's cows. But um, when you bring the landowners and the allotments and the BLM, it's, well, there could be elk. Um, the outhouse ditch, there was actually the trailhead for the um, narrows had an outhouse, and it was over an irrigation ditch. So people were doing their business, and it was going straight into the irrigation ditch. So that's, of course, what they, what they pointed to. But that was, I don't know. <laughs> but that was fixed, and this, this problem still persisted. Um, and this is kind of the similar data. Um, basically, the circles are below the pastures with and without irrigation. So with irrigation of those kind of ready, the top line um, blue is without the irrigation. Um, and then the other two are um, above the, yeah, so above the pastures and below the pastures with and without irrigation. And then the yellow ones are actually in the return ditch itself, um, where below the pastures is in the river just down, downstream. So those yellow ones should be higher. Um, so in 2009 is when we documented the problem. Hikers started to be issued warnings um, that their, whatever their filtration system should be capable of handling the E. coli. Um, funded the, they had these big stakeholder meetings and the outhouse was the first thing they pointed to and we, they fixed that pretty quickly. Um, the other thing the, the Park Service did is all of these standards are set on what type of use. Um, so it was set to secondary human use, which is basically usually like fishing or wading. You're just kind of in the water occasionally. And primary human use is full body submersion, which they felt was valid given that you've got two-year-olds that are just splashing in it all day while their dad's hiking or whatever. Um, and that basically lowers the standard, the primary human use. And that, that put it on the 303D list, which is the list that people don't want to be on. Um, basically means you're violating the Clean Water Act and you need to come up with a total maximum daily load, which is the contaminants coming in. Basically, you need to fix the problem. You can't ignore it anymore once it's on that list. Um, our data, which was good for us, is there were all these from the various landowners and other stakeholders saying, you know, it wasn't cattle, it's um, elk, it was people doing this deliberately, or the Park Service went out and they're sabotaging us, they don't like grazing. And the state of Utah basically is like, this is the most, in t we, we make decisions on way less data than this. This is as sound as it comes. Um, you guys have done a good job and the, Again, the science is clear. We can argue about what to do about it, but um, the science is clear that you are violating the 303D or the Clean Water Act and being on the 303D list. Um, and a new irrigation system was put in in 2014, so we'll see what that holds when we look at data from this summer. Oh, and this is just a, a better example since I've had two downers. Um, our water quality work here with the park has actually documented some really, really good water in, that's coming out of the West Elks here. So basically all these green streams <coughs> are now the opposite of 303D this. They've received outstanding waters designation. That means even, and there are, there are cattle up here in the, in the West Elks. Um, and so even with the current land management, the Park Service felt that was important to document, um, to say, hey, look, we're, there's something good going on here. What is the blue one? I think those might have been existing already, and those were in the Forest Service land. Um, so the, you can't really see it, but this is the park boundary. So we've got a lot of stuff in the park designated. Do you attribute that to less grazing in this area? And it's certainly less intense. And again, I think there's, it's a different system. Um, we're a lot more resilient. We've had elk up here forever. Um, Zion, you, we really haven't had a large ungulate since prior ice ages. <laughs> Different, like Paleozoic, I think there was, a, there was a historic bison out there, but the American bison was never out there. Um, so yeah, these are, these are park service where the science was actually working pretty well. Um, I used to work for the South Florida, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in South Florida, um, basically doing ecological services where my whole job was to basically see if an action was violating the um, Endangered Species Act. Um, 
I wasn't there a very long time, but one of my first projects involving Panthers came across and I said, this is a Jeopardy opinion, which there have been like three or four of them. It doesn't, it's not used very much, it's a kind of a showstopper. Um, people didn't really agree with me, but I, was, I basically said, um, they're, they're hauling in cats from West Texas there because the, the numbers are so low that the Panthers are having genital defects, um, low sperm counts, their hearts are, aren't working. Um, and once they brought in these cats from Texas, that fixed those problems and the population expanded. So I was basically like, well, we're not a zoo here. Um, if we don't have enough habitat for these species, we've already passed Jeopardy. But I was told um, that that wasn't our job, actually, to evaluate Jeopardy. And that if I didn't like the opinion in that office, I should look for a job elsewhere, which is when I came to the Park Service. Um, but a lot of their stuff, and I guess long way to get to my point here, um, a lot of their stuff was based on a very well, very st significant, statistically significant study that looked at um, panthers with radio collars on. And they had a ton of cats, a ton of locations. They basically had all of the adults collared uh, in the daytime. So they took all of the panthers um, basically from sunrise to sunup. They didn't do any nighttime stuff. And they clearly stated that in all the papers. Um, but if you're a, a panther in South Florida um, in the daytime at 100 degrees, you're not going to be in the open areas, which is where people want to develop golf courses and condominiums and whatnot. You're going to be in these hammocks. Um, so it's basically a free ride for people to do stuff in these open areas. Um, but if you're also a panther and your main habitat is at dawn and dusk, they're going to be out in the open areas foraging, and that's where you get stuff. And they've since remedied that, but um, at the time I was there, that was the primary study. Um, again, this was for Jeff's policy class the first time I did it, and I think it was 2012, and I was all fired up with the election. Um, Rasmussen is another polling company. Maybe you've heard this story, but they're, they're a Republican polling company, and their science, again, is very sound, but their pool of voters that they um, call are people they call during the day and they call landlines. So you're automatically getting people that aren't working during the day and that don't have the cell phone as their only communication and their polls consistently were four or five points um, towards the Republican and th their science was good and of that pool that was correct um, but whether that's the actual voting population or not that's a whole different debate um, so uh, two cases where the science science is actually really good there's nothing wrong with the science it's how you use it they were just consistently, the Rasmussen polls had four or five more points for Romney than most of the other polls. Um, and I don't know, I don't, I don't know what the strategy is that, but they probably had their own polls that they actually got a more to get a real story. I, th I think you'd want the real story, but. Um, and then this was from my master's work in Florida, Florida grasshopper sparrows and these bombing, work on a bombing range. So if you're not familiar with the Endangered Species Act, you need a federal nexus, but we're on a federal facility, so that's the federal nexus. Um, most of the time it's the Clean Water Act that you're affecting a resource. And we, we couldn't get, and we had really, really good science that said these, these places need summer fires. Um, this county has the highest number of lightning strikes in the country. Um, so that tells me that it's, uh, summers, summer fires have been a long time um, component here. But uh, winter fires, again, were better for cattle forage. And for some reason, we felt the bombing range needed cattle on it. Um, and then they also had these non-native pine plantations. Again, the, bomb, the bombing rangers manage kind of multi-use. Um, and we would say every year, do summer fires, take the non-native pines out, and they wouldn't do it. In 2012, they lost their last sparrow population, and they decided to take the cows off. Um, but just kind of when the political pressure hits. Um, um, this is the last one, a little bit more local. Um, one of the, pro the main project that I, or not the main project, one of the big projects I work on is the big, big river stuff, which I didn't get into. Um, but in the Grand Canyon, there's a whole Grand Canyon Monitoring and Research Center, which has $7 million a year to monitor the Grand Canyon. Um, it's below Glen Canyon Dam, which basically once you hit the dam, you lose all your sediment. It drops out because the water stops. And it's, it's I, we should just call it Wally World and, and let it be that. Let it be a fun place to go rafting, but let's not spend money on a, a dead river. I mean, you could not put enough sediment in there to get it back to natural. Whereas our, my entity is, we get a million dollars a year to do those 11 protocols in 16 parks and Big Rivers is just one of those protocols in four of the parks. And, but up here we have the Yampa River, which is basically the last wild free river in the Colorado Basin. The Colorado River is dammed, but it still has a relatively natural hydrograph. Um, 
and even Flaming Gorge on the green and Blue Mesa here, um, they are dammed and that makes a big difference, but due to endangered fish, they have, have changed their hydrographs out of the dams to try and get them to, um, to be in more natural hydrographs. So basically no group of scientists would spend seven of the $8 million on the Grand Canyon if they had some. But um, John McCain's been a scientist for, a, I mean a senator, senator for a long time and is a powerful one and likes the Grand Canyon, so. Um, they do a bunch of sediment work oh, um, and for sand, they do vegetation as well too, but it's basically the, the sandbars in Grand Canyon and they, the Little Colorado is a wild tributary below Glen Canyon and basically they monitor that till there's enough sediment that they think there's a high, a, a high flow would do good of moving that sediment around. And they do some stuff with endangered fish, but again, there's only one endangered fish. There's four up, still alive up here. Uh, so it's just, yeah, not where I'd spend the money. Um, so I said earlier that our, my main job is to get information to the park managers, um, but we're always reminded by the higher ups the, that basically um, all of that doesn't matter if the public doesn't believe in the park service or support our goals. Um, and if we don't get that information out to them in some fashion, um, we're missing our job. Um, so, you know, these bottom, bottom part of this pyramid is the science stuff and that's where I like to work and that's where most of the people that work with me like to work. Um, it's the, the peer reviewed stuff that goes to journals or technical reports. It's the 70 page technical report with the 200 page appendices that I actually like to look at. Um, superintendents and even our division chiefs of resources don't necessarily like to look at that or don't have the time. Um, so we need to make sure we have this stuff down here because we need to make sure the science is sound, but perhaps for a lot of them the more important piece is that, that peak of the pyramid where it's a paragraph summarizing this 100 page technical report um, and they can look at it and move on. So this is kind of our bread and butter. These are all our natural resource technical reports. Um, they're all peer reviewed. Um, some of our stuff we do move into scientific journals, but in a lot of cases say invasive plants at Colorado National Monument outside of Grand Junction. That's a really, really important part, report, report for the park. Um, it, they can do a lot with it, but no scientific journal is ever gonna be interested in what the invasive plant level is at Colorado National Monument. So it's kind of a mix. Um, some of the parks want this really sound science that isn't significant to the scientific community. Um, so this is kind of what we did in 2013. Um, several of these NRTR reports, um, journal, some journal articles, and then you can see some of the monitoring reports that we produced that year. But the other thing we do is for each one of these parks, we do a two-page um, brief, which covers the work that we did there that year. And basically we tell a superintendent that if you read about um, water quality at Timpanogos Cave and you read those two paragraphs and there's nothing wrong, that you can be, feel good. There's nothing else you need to look into. If there is a problem, it's gonna be noted in there, but it's gonna have one of those technical reports behind it. And it's already gone through QA, QC, quality assurance, quality control, it's gone through peer review. And so you can, you can stand up at a meeting and say we have a water quality issue um, and you know that it's not anecdotal evidence. It's not somebody saying, I think there's something going on there. Um, and then we also do that for each one of our protocols. And if you're at all interested in any of these, these are all on the web page that I think um, Jessica shared with you. And so for these, we do basically a page one that um, stays somewhat static, a, little, a few sentences change from year to year, and then we do a different page two that kind of dives into a story um, a bit more. Uh, and these have been incredibly incredibly popular, even with what I would think would be our science audience. Um, even a busy division chief, sometimes this is all they have time to read, even if they are a scientist. Um, so this is your main tool for disseminating information? Yeah, I mean, we, we never put out a brief with a finding unless it's already gone through a peer reviewed. Right. So the technical so report is first. And, yep. and it gives enough information, so if I was to make a management decision, I could read a brief yep. and feel comfortable that yeah, I mean, if there, if there is a brief and there's an issue, you probably want to read the technical report. And then, then, you'll, then you'll have it covered. Um, the brief uh, just lets you know there's an issue. How quickly do these come out after the research is made? These are generally done annually. 
Um, so it can be six to nine months. But if there, again, if there's a problem, there's already been other communication, like with our water quality. We're letting those people go almost as soon as we get the lab results back, even if it hasn't gone through all of the QA, QC. Um, and then I think you all saw this one. Um, and then again, this day and age, most of our stuff is out on our webpage. Um, usually that's even how it's disseminated. Um, and then lastly, our, our Facebook page, which I was a staunchly against. I didn't think this was our job. Um, I thought our job was, again, to get information to these managers and not something out to the public. Um, we had three people on our staff that really argued pretty vehemently, strongly for creating a Facebook page, basically saying it doesn't take a lot of work and I think we can reach a lot of people. So I succumbed and said, yeah, let's try it. Um, and they have kind of won me over. Um, let's see. So this is our last water quality report, um, and 1,415 people saw that. There's no way, if I just put that on our webpage, that 1,400 people even know about it. Um, now, I don't know how many of those people read it, but they, they would argue that that doesn't even matter. Um, when you're battling Tom Coburn's waste in government report and all these examples of um, bad bad science or poorly use of money, this is a good one, that people, if they, even if they don't read it, they can say, hey, these guys were out there um, and they produced a report. Um, this one is our 4th of July post from this year, um, red, white, and blue in Moab. 109,000 people saw that. So again, 109,000 people know we exist and we added 250, I think we're up to 1,500 people that follow us, whatever that means in Facebook. Are um, you using ads? I do not know. Is that a big difference on Facebook pages? Yeah, like are you paying for it to be promoted? No. It's all organic. Yeah. So sometimes you can pay like five dollars a day and it will show up on more people's news feeds. Yep. Versus organic reach means that people that are your fans see it and then like it and then their friends see it. I can't even imagine what what hoops I would have to go to to pay to get advertising. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure it's all organic. I mean, a lot of the parks have a page as well, so that definitely helps <coughs> helps us um, have a Facebook page, Candylands, and then so they'll post it on they'll, their pages. Yeah, and sometimes we'll share something that they put up um, and whatnot. So again, yeah, just just having people know we're out there, um, I think, is a good thing, and it is pretty easy. We're taking pictures all the time. We're in beautiful places. Um, it's not too hard to do with, with minimal cost and pretty big reward, I think. So that's it.